Joyce is going to provide us her presentation tonight on Louviers, Colorado. And Louviers was dynamite. Take, take it away, Joyce. All right. Well, that this is Oh. Okay. Here it comes. All right. <clears throat> can all of you hear me? I hope. And we can hear you fine. You're good to okay. go. And you got a full screen of Lavere's Village Clubhouse here. Still standing, still being used very much. So this is history, but it's also current events. Uh, Lavere's was dynamite in its day. And you won't believe me when we get to the end and I'll tell you how much they made. But E.I. DuPont de, de, de Namur and Company, very French name, and I don't pronounce French very well, but in Levers too is a town in France. And when I worked at the library there, occasionally we would get people from France who stopped by just to see where Levers, Colorado was. I'm wondering how many of you know where Levers, Colorado is. But let's stick to our French history first, because the DuPonts became famous in France for their black powder. And they were the best in all of Europe. And they continued for two or three generations of uh, owners who were making this black powder. And they decided <clears throat> with that third generation, they should go to the Americas to Delaware was where they picked and make their black powder because it was so good and uh, the United States was beginning to build and construction. So away they went to Delaware. But after they got there, the, sec the third generation, um, the first leader died in his 60s, the second in his 50s, and they were running out of people. So they went to the fourth generation. And these three cousins, all DuPonts, became the cousins who made DuPont an American institution. So the fellow in the middle is Alfred DuPont, and he was the first son of a first son of a first son. And if you were kings, of course, that really counted. But the French were still counting things like that at that time. And so when the group that was in Delaware was looking for a leader, they called him into the board meeting when they, uh, to talk to him about what they should do. They were also having another problem besides the fact that they were losing their leaders. Um, they were losing business for a little bit because this new product had come up. It was called nitro, nitroglycerin and it was in, you made it into dynamite. And it was very good, but it was also very dangerous and they hadn't started using it yet. So Alfred came to the meeting, listened to what they said and what they said basically was, we ought to sign up with this company and, um, uh, and just let them pay us for everything because they're already doing dynamite and they kind of know what they're doing. But Alfred didn't say that. He said, I think we should keep this in the family. It should stay DuPont. I'm going to call my cousin Colby. His name was Thomas Coleman, but call me Colby. He's in Kentucky and they're doing a lot of business out there. And I want to hear what he has to say and I think he would make a good president of this company. He called Colby and Colby came and said, sure, I'll be president of your company, but I want Pierre to become the treasurer. And Pierre had a very interesting history. Um, he got his experience in finance because his father died when Pierre was only 14. And he began taking care of his mother and his nine siblings. And he learned a lot in the process. 
and was very good with money. So, okay, we now have uh, three members who are going to make this, make this a company for, and their generation is going to tackle the dynamite. So, where are they going to go? They began, and they did tackle the dynamite, and it was working. And they were uh, in business much sooner than anybody thought they would be. So they started thinking about expanding to the West. Now, if you've been on the Denver, uh, the Durango and Silverton train, you know that they carved it out of solid rock, and that took dynamite. If you've been on the train on the right-hand side, the Georgetown Loop, they did something else that was impossible. They uh, took their train up an 8% slope, only they cheated and they went up one side um, at 4%, put a bridge across, and then went up the other side at 4%. So they were uh, in business and could go from Georgetown to Silver Plume on their trains. They were using dynamite. Now let me see if I can get my laser pointer going here, yes. Okay, up this side, across the bridge, and up the way we go, I'm in business. All right, what else? Where else would use dynamite? The Argo Mill in Idaho Springs um, used dynamite to build a tunnel up to Black Hawk and Central City because that saved those people about 25 miles of uh, distance that they would have to carry their ore in trucks down hills and then back up hills if they could put them through tunnels. So Colorado had a lot going for it in the dynamite front. Even small mines. Boulder County had hundreds, probably maybe even thousands of mining claims. Um, I know about this mine because I know that miner right there personally. And it was run by three men. The first one was a lawyer. You need a lawyer so you can get your claim properly documented because the worst thing in the world is to dig a hole, discover gold, and then find out you don't own it. So the lawyer was first. Second was an engineer. So he built this structure here. And he also had a truck. That was another uh, selling point for the engineer. And the dynamite man there is my father-in-law. Uh, he was in Boulder and he was a, had a day job, as did these other two men. So they just did their mining on the weekends. Um, but uh, he was a dynamite man because he had put himself through college uh, working in the coal mines in the summer. And also, sometimes uh, people are really overcome by nitroglycerin fumes and they can't stay in the ground in a hole with a dynamite uh, for very long. But he, it didn't bother him and he was the dynamite man. So you should uh, think a little, uh, take a second look at some of your accounting professors if you went to see you. <laughs> You never know what their weekend job is. Big jobs, big projects like the Moffat Tunnel were where the most money was spent and the most money was saved. Um, I hope this, yeah, I hope the marker is working here. And this is Eldora. It's a ski, ski slope that is on the eastern side of the Continental Divide. And to get to the western side, at that day and time, they built a railroad. Look at the railroad. Can you imagine riding on this? They actually took the rails off and turned it into a dirt road, and we have driven on this. Here's the eye of the needle. So that's a very small tunnel. And Rollins Pass is up near 12,000 feet. So, it would take hours and hours and hours and probably you would wish you could spend the night uh, to get from here. Moffitt said, if we built a tunnel and he had measured it, it would be a little over six miles. That's it. You could do that in a train in no time. 
Well, he didn't get it done uh, because he didn't get the money for it right away. But the plan and the idea did get done. And they not only built a tunnel for the rails, they also built a tunnel for water. Because when they tunnel, they, um, they put a bore, you know, a small drill, so you know what kind of rocks you're getting to. And when they looked at that borehole, they thought, if we got that bigger, you could pour water down it. And you could take water from the western slope, which is much wetter than the eastern slope usually, and take it right on into Denver, which they did at the Moffat Tunnel. So today we get our some of our water through there. And even Washington DC was looking west now. Um, they can see the, that the magazines thought that Teddy Roosevelt was mad about the West, but he's really a New York guy, New York born, uh, was a uh, congressman in New York, was the chief of police in New York City, so he's a big city boy. But when he got out West, he was in his element. He loved it. And campaigning in that day and age was done by train and you pulled into a station and you got on the back end of that train and a platform and you had an audience waiting for you. So in 1903, um, Teddy Roosevelt stopped and spoke at Sedalia. And Levere's is very near Sedalia, if you know where Sedalia is. Okay, so let's see where, all right, here we are. And you can see right away, we're in Highlands Ranch. There's the Highlands Ranch golf course, Highlands Ranch, Chatfield. And you just get on Santa Fe and from uh, Windcrest where I live and several of the people that I talked with and uh, for this report live, we just go under C-470 down Santa Fe past the High Line Canal, which goes right through our property too. And then here's Roxboro, but you skip that, skip that, keep going. And here's Levere's. So you all knew that, right? I hope you did. <laughs> and if you have made that right-hand turn, if you're headed south uh, to Levere's, you will pass what was the old rail station you will go across two sets of railroad tracks. So that was one of the things that attracted the DuPonts. It had transportation for their supplies to come to them. And you will go across Plum Creek and there they had a water supply. So that was their pick and they were sticking to it. Now, even the plans for this were extremely French. And I want to thank Stephen Gale for, uh, I, I got some of these materials from his work. Uh, and this is, this is Levere's, the village that was built starting in nine, 1906. And this picture was taken in 37. So it was pretty well built out by 37. I, uh, they may have added some more, but uh, it was in the shape. And this is a plan of Richelieu in France. So that was a seven, 17th century um, <laughs> village. And so this was quite like a 17th century village with lots of landscaping. And this empty patch here, can you see that? Um, with just little spots, that was a nursery. So they were growing the plants that they were gonna to continue to, to garden with. And you can see small houses here for the workers, slightly bigger for maybe office workers. Uh, and way over here, and it, it doesn't, in real life, this, this hill is much higher than it looks on this map, uh, on this photo. Um, but the big houses for management, for the superintendent, were here, and they could look over the factory, over what they call the plant. 
and see what was going on and they could look over town and see what was going on. And this right here was a smokestack because they provided their own electricity for their works, for their plant and for their residents. Um, in its day, you could spot Levere's by looking for the 200 foot tall smokestack. Today, one way to spot it if you're going south on Santa Fe is to look for the really nice patch of trees, really big green lush looking trees that are growing there today. So we're going to see what, okay, here's some, one of the, the station. It uh, is no longer a train station, uh, but you can see, you can recognize the building when you go past it. And here are the first houses that were built, the workers' houses. The plan was that first you build the houses, you get your workers there, then you build the plant. So this workers' house was 24 feet by 20 feet. 480 square feet <laughs> and I'm wondering how they crammed all these I hope these were two families but it looks like the kids mom dad and, and maybe grandma and the dogs <laughs> so workers houses in a row and a train station so they are getting close to being ready to go to work Um, this is a worker's house today. So this one is, uh, was built in 1906, so it's over 100 years old. And it has more solid windows and doors. Um, it was extended, and, and DuPont did this. If you go there, you can see when they added on back porches to all the little houses, they added on the back porches and they included running water. How about that? And real bathrooms indoors. So uh, they continued to improve once they got the plant going. Okay. And also one reason I wanted to show you this is that the hilly countryside, or they maybe enhanced that a little bit and made it even taller, provided a berm that went between the houses and the factory. So they would be protected. So they were always thinking about these things, about protection and safety in their um, planning, even when they still were just building the houses. Well, there you have it, Levere's, established 1906. And I think that sign was there in 1906, don't you? Okay, and now we're getting the manager's houses, two stories, um, as, asbestos shingle siding, and DuPont made that. That was part of what they uh, manufactured as well, not at this plant, but at other plants. And that was, uh, would have been in the 40s and the 50s. And we had, they had three choices. You could have green, you could have white, or you could have kind of an adobe peach color. Well, and, and a much bigger house for managers. So uh, some of these houses have been there 114 years, many of them over 100. So let's take a look at the top of the hill, shall we? Yeah. So if you've been to Levere's, I hope you did uh, go, you would have to go north once, once you've come into the village and up the hill, and at the top of the hill was this house in black and white. And I was out there just two weeks ago, and it's quite the same, except that they have more deer than I've ever seen before. <laughs> this time I saw lots of deer. And this was the first house built, and that was the superintendent's house. And look at his car. He already has a car in 1908. Is this that house? I said to myself as I was looking between hedges and um, yes, it is. If you look at the windows, that window, this window, that window, and the dormer, 
Yep. So this house, well over 100 years old, is still in good shape and being used. And then also up there on that management hilltop was the doctor's house. So that's another advantage you have of living in a company town. You pay a dollar a month and you get all the care that the doctor could do in his office. And he didn't have to uh, use his house for an office. He had an office right up at the gate and near that was nearer where everybody was. So free medical, well, I'm sorry, a dollar a month for your medical service, not free. All right, we got our houses built. Now we're working on the plant. And that's what they call it. It's, it's not, they call it a plant, not a factory. Um, and these pictures show some of the safety measures. And again, this is something that DuPont emphasized again and again, um, safety measures. And some of them sound like some of our safety measures today. One of the things was you have small houses and you never put more than three or four at the most in one of these houses. So these would be a, a small house in which a particular process would be done. And over here, another small house, no, no big warehouses, no big plants. You have small houses where each operation is carefully done so that it, if anything happens, it's just two or three or four people that are going to be caught. So they thought it out in advance. And then they used, they were, it was a little narrow gauge rail line that brought the supplies in on rail, but they didn't take them out on rail. They took them out on trucks. We'll see that later. Okay, what else did they do for their, um, oh yes, oh yes. What else they did for safety at the plant was something that is a whole lot more trouble than wearing a mask. <laughs> it was that they did not allow the men into the plant in their street clothes. No way, Jose. You had to wear company coveralls because the coveralls had no metal, no pockets, uh, and no way, uh, even your shoes, you had to change shoes because sometimes shoes have nail and any metal that could strike on rocks and make a spark could then make an explosion. So you not only had to socially <laughs> Uh, keep your group small. You also had to wear the company uniform if you went into the plant at all. Okay. Now here's that giant smokestack and they are blowing it up <laughs> because at this point they have stopped doing the electricity because the county has started doing electricity everywhere. So they're no longer doing their own electricity. They're just using county electricity and away went the smoke. They also provided water absolutely free. They had to um, you know, manage the water for the whole plant and for all the houses. They charged for the electricity when they were making it two or three cents per kilowatt hour. <laughs> Sounds pretty cheap to me. Um, they quit making the electricity about in the 1950s as they began to um, grow and the county began to grow and the electricity came to them. So what else do they need now? They have the plant, they have houses for everybody. Mm, oh yeah, oh yeah, we need a hotel for the single guys, for the uh, company uh, experts that are coming in to teach you safety or to help you decide what kind of uh, 
dynamite you need next or what kind of plan you need next. Also, they had a dining hall in there and you could buy a few things. So yeah, this was a, a useful thing, a hotel and a post office. They still have their post office, but the hotel turned out to be not needed for but about 20 years because then they had people settled there. They had enough people to run everything and they would just have special projects or people coming in for special occasions and they used bed and breakfast. So the, the bigger houses that could have an extra bedroom could earn a little money by taking in a boarder for the length of time he was going to be there. Bed and breakfast. But they still have their little post office and they still have this next building that we saw earlier. Here it is when it was first built and that was in 1917. So again, it's over a hundred years old. Um, and this is the, the village clubhouse and bowling alley. And that's probably what you'll see when you go. If you go to Levere's, that is where your event might be. Um, the bowling alley I love because it just looks like a house from head on. But then it's this long, strange, skinny house. <laughs> There's really just two bowling alleys in the whole thing. Um, now, it, it, this was kind of a finishing touch. And the fact that it's still there and it's still being used says that it was successful in the things that it did. Uh, and the things that it did were an assembly hall, a billiards hall, um, uh, meeting rooms, history rooms, a library upstairs that even had uh, leaded glass windows that you sh shut in front of the shelves, very nice. And uh, it had a professional movie projector. The assembly hall made a really nice movie theater. They had first run uh, theaters for the whole, uh, for, you know, once a week, they'd have the home movies, but they were first run like John Wayne or Clark Gable or, you know, some of their our old favorites. Uh, and upstairs in that projection room, they lined it with metal because the light was so bright and the, it occasionally threw off sparks. So again, they were safety conscious and didn't want the building burning down. Uh, but the, the projector is long gone now. <laughs> okay, well, it seems like we got everything except that some people wanted a church, but um, DuPont couldn't build a church. Now that just wasn't business-like that they would build a church, but they would allow you to use the schoolhouse for a church. How about that? Because on Sundays, it's not used. So, so they organized and, but then they still wanted a church. So they asked for a lot and DuPont gave them a lot. And then they asked for some help with materials, but they, there were a lot of construction people. They built their own church. And here it is right here with the steeple and the nice church windows and everything. Then the area began to grow and Sedalia was much bigger than Levere's. And Sedalia had a church. And so some people started going to that church. And in the 40s and 50s, they started getting their own cars. So some people went off to church to whatever denomination they were. And um, they couldn't afford to keep the church up. So rather than let it go to pieces, they sold it to somebody who was going to make a home out of a church. And I've been in it, and it it does make it, you have a very big living room, but it does make a, a home. And yet that idea of having a church in your community came back again about 20 years after that. And another group got together. When a house came up for sale, they refitted it to become a church. So now in Levere's, you have a church that became a house and a house that became a church. Well, 
this is a, a really good time period here. Um, and, and I want you to see the staff. And it shows, and what I like about this picture is, it shows you the many different kinds of people it took to run a factory and a community and the business and the offices. So you can see in the picture, you can see suits, you know, ties and white shirt and a jacket. And there's about a half dozen of those. So that would be the admin and the, the superintendents, the guys at the top. And then you see uh, white shirts and ties. And so they were business types, office types, um, but not, didn't need a jacket. And then I can see guys in flannel shirts, plaid shirts, and jeans. And so they were probably working outdoors. And I even see five people with, uh, uh, oh, they're well, and I see a bunch of hats on. I'm not sure why they're wearing hats. But um, at, by this time, in the 40s, uh, for one thing, we were getting into war. And somehow dynamite fits in that too. And so they were beginning to ramp up to make tons and tons of dynamite. And they were reaching the point where they could make 20 million pounds of dynamite <laughs> in a month or two, two yeah, millions of pounds of dynamite in a month. So they were really in business, full on. So the, their business decision had worked out very well and they were doing great. So let's take a look at two people who lived in Levere's. One of them worked and one of them came as a kid. So on the left is John Stout and his family moved to Levere's right after World War II. The young lady there is Carolyn uh, Stout, then she would have been, and her twin sister was named Marilyn, with an O in it, just like Carolyn. And uh, they were in the sixth grade, and their brother Roy was younger. And they had to wait for a house. They couldn't find a house. They're, all the houses were taken. Nobody was leaving. And Carolyn said nobody wanted to leave, and they didn't unless they were transferred. So they just had to wait until somebody finally left, and there was a house for them. So they were going to a regular school in West Denver, Eagleton. I'm not familiar with it, but it was a regular-sized big elementary school. Then they moved in and Carolyn went to this school and her sister Marilyn and Roy. It's a three-room school and there were three teachers. So they had first, second, and third grade and one teacher and one room. They had fourth, fifth, and sixth grade and Carolyn was in the sixth grade uh, in another room. And there were about 20 of them. There were only 12 of the younger kids. And then they had seventh and eighth graders. And again, there were just 12 of them, but they were three teachers for eight grades. So that was quite a change for her. But uh, it, it, was, it seemed to have worked very well. She, she did fine. After the eighth grade, uh, the students would have to go to Castle Rock High School. So, um, something happened in 1962, and I'll talk about it a little later, and the three-room uh, schoolhouse was closed, and from then on, all the Levere Elementary students uh, went to Sedalia, to the Sedalia Elementary School. Okay. Well, Carolyn's family finally got a house right there, and this was the view right, right across from the clubhouse. 
And so she just thought it was marvelous because they had all kinds of things. I already told you about the movies once a week. They had bingo with prizes. They had a Christmas party. They probably had a party for practically every season. They had card games. They had adult parties and that kids weren't allowed to come to. And they had dances that were for everyone. The rent for her house, for their first house, was probably $20 a month. The smallest houses were $11.50 a month. And the manager's two-story house was $30 a month. So, uh, but Carolyn's favorite thing was the bowling alley. And um, they, you had to be a certain age before you could play. And the children would get paid 10 cents a pin for setting the pins up in the bowling alley. I hope some of you have seen the bowling alley. You have to catch it. It's only open uh, when they have an event and they have people to, to man the, to put the pins up and to uh, just take care of it. But I think, I wonder if you can rent it. I wouldn't, I don't know. I'd have to find out about that. And there were bowling teams and uh, they, the men's team bowled at night and the women's team bowled in the afternoon and the kids had to be a certain age before they were allowed to bowl. So here's the last, uh, the seventh and eighth grade, the bigger kids in the, at the last years of the, uh, the little schoolhouse. And then Carolyn went off to the University of Denver and when she got there, she had a job and she was going to school and she met Pete Kellamine, who worked for the Research Institution in Electromagnetic Propagation Division. Carolyn got her degree in, at DU in English and uh, she lives in Wencrest now and is editor of our learners group, uh, newsletter, The Lamp. <laughs> So she kept her English going. And they had three children. One of them is still in the area, and he's in an even more technical job than uh, Pete's sounded. And, um, and he works for Lockheed Martin. So the Levere schools closed, as I said, uh, in 62. So I think we're going to talk about, no, uh, first I'll talk about transportation. Because John was head of, supervisor of transportation. Now, if there's anything that I think could uh, be harder to do safely than make dynamite, it would be deliver dynamite in trucks. But uh, the boxes were sturdy. And if you're driving to New Mexico or to Wyoming or in Colorado, you're going up into the mountains, what could possibly go wrong? That's what John had to think about. What could possibly go wrong? And he did everything he could to avoid those things that might go wrong. So look at that truck there, and you will see the, the DuPont logo in the top left-hand corner right up here. And then in big capital letters, probably bright yellow, explosives. If you, if you missed it, it's on the front here again, explosives. So at least people had their warning. They knew what they were dealing with. Another preventive measure he took was to make sure they always had two drivers. And there were a couple of advantages to that. The trucks could keep moving all the time. They didn't ever have to spend the night. You really don't want to park a truck full of dynamite out in front of a motel and <laughs> leave it alone at night. So you just keep driving and there's a bunk up in the back of the cab. Uh, and so one's driving, one's sleeping or resting and they took turns if they were going to eat, uh, somebody stayed with the truck and you kept the motor on and you parked it somewhere where you would be able to move forward if you saw anything going wrong. 
And John told the tale about the time that a truck was coming up behind the, the big truck, a, a car was coming up behind the truck and it wasn't stopping. It didn't seem to see the truck. How could you miss the truck? But the guy actually drove right under the, the front end of his truck went underneath the big truck and the driver quickly put it into gear and moved it forward and there was no explosion. So John said that was the closest they ever came to having an explosion with the dynamite truck. I can't imagine. That would really be horrible. <laughs> okay, again, uh, John uh, Hookerheide, who lives in Wencrest, is a retiree from DuPont. And he sold DuPont, but you don't just sell dynamite and hand it over and say, well, here you are, go at it. You carefully help select, and there are many kinds of dynamite, and this is one thing I learned in preparing this. There are many different kinds or different levels or different ways to use it. And so uh, John had to go to all of these places, to, uh, to Chile, and all the way to Alaska. And you don't just go for a day or two. You look at the outfit, you look at the layout, you look at what they're trying to do, and then you, you know, talk products with them because there are many different kinds. And then after they get the product, you come back and you explain it to them. You tell them all of the aspects of safety and all of the uses that they need. So he went from Chile to Alaska. Here there's three in a row, Washington, Oregon, and California. Uh, Michigan and Minnesota up here. Kentucky, this is, the dot was bigger than necessary. And New York, uh, all of those places. He had to go and live while he was working with these companies companies. And, oh my goodness, where did you go? Oh, I lost you. My screen has paused. There. Good. It's back. Um, so the safety was, was really a big factor. And John said he thought the DuPont factory did an excellent job on their safety. Um, and, and he never actually you know, worked it in, but just knew about it. <laughs> okay. Hmm. All right. Okay. Um, are you seeing the screen now? We're seeing it yeah. uh, in your browser, in the browsing view, not the full screen view. Okay. Um, I'm okay. Let's then get it to the full screen view. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Well, come on, slides one. Well, I'll finish up this way uh, so that I don't take a bunch of time just trying to get it back. Um, this is that same little house. In 1962, I, I wanted to tell you about the uh, how they ended their run in, um, in Levere's. The houses were sold to the residents first. They reached the decision that there were now so many new forms of dynamite and new forms of other explosives. And for a change, instead of being more dangerous, they were safer. <laughs> and so their setup at their plant was for making the good old fashioned nitroglycerin dynamite. So they were going to stop doing that and go just to special products like rope dynamite. I, I can imagine it, but I really don't know what it was. So a house like this, was so reasonable that uh, people bought it <clears throat> in 1962, even if they were gonna keep their job and still live there, but they would own the house. Uh, but they would have to start paying for electricity and water and all that. 
uh, but they sold to the residents first, and that was was uh, very well received. Um, so here's that big 50 pound box of dynamite, and I can't imagine how many of those they can get into a truck. But um, the safety measures that everybody was taking, let's take a look at some numbers. In 1908, the plant opened, and I'd like you to just try to think, okay, maybe it's kind of like what we're going through now. The plant opened, they keep telling you about all these safety things. You have to do this, you have to do that. How, you know, the instructions are fresh in your mind when you go to work. How long do you think it would be before the first accident that was fatal? So just keep an eye on that a date number up there and make your guess in your head two years, five years, 10 years before they got careless or what? Ah, well, look at that. <laughs> somebody wasn't listening or somebody didn't believe them or it just was a great big accident, a real accident. We don't know. And that's one of the tough things about explosion deaths is that you really don't have a witness and, and it's hard to tell what happened. So 1908, one death. All right, well, I hope that taught everybody it was really possible. Well, now, now we have three deaths this time and it's just three years later. So the lectures alone didn't do it. But I think the thing that did do it was that one death, it was the person who made the mistake that died. But with three deaths, somebody made a mistake and two other people died. So after that, we went through the teens, the 20s, and the 30s with no deaths at all. 1940, they're at their peak, and there were two deaths. And I just, this is just interesting. Again, it was the small space, another death. And then there was another long period of safety. But in that period, they had decided they would be closing the plant. And so this was the worst, worst accident of all for people. And when that happened, they did close the plant. They just quit producing anything. And yet it took them another 20 years before um, DuPont was totally no longer a factor in, in the village, in Levere's. Because when they have a product that is so volatile that can make such a change in the environment, um, they always remove everything in the plant area, everything where the explosive was made or put together. They remove it all. And it, they did it slowly um, because the people had bought their own houses now and all. So they were out of the, of the uh, community. <laughs> You know, they were out of the company town business, but they were still around taking care of the, the plant itself and not leaving something that was going to surprise anybody later on. So it took them 20 years. So um, the, the, law, the village center here uh, served the library became a part of the Douglas County Libraries. And you can see on the front of that truck, I hope it's big enough you can see it, it says Englewood Public Libraries. And I was working for the library then and I was working at Levere's and we were loading up the bookmobile to take books to Roxborough and to take books to Castle Pines. And we were trying it out to see if they said they wanted a library and they turned out for the bookmobile. So their libraries were under construction and they have 
uh, both have libraries today, and this bookmobile and LaVere's had a part in that. This is a Christmas party at the uh, LaVere's community house up in the library. So uh, it shows that this, it's still being used that way. If you go out there to see things, the library works only on Tuesday, is open only on Tuesday and Saturdays uh, because there's such a small library, um, but they're still open, so many years later. Now, this is kind of the, the last part and uh, kind of happily ever after part. It was an old building when, <laughs> you know, it was approaching 100 and it looked like this. And not only was it old, it wasn't safe. There was only one stair and we would take books of, boxes of books down those stairs. But what happened if a fire started right here? There was no other way out of that building from upstairs. So they needed us and they put in a ramp and stairs so that there is a way out from upstairs. So it was a safety measure um, and it looks better. And then just the looks in general here, <laughs> the landscaping is taking over the world here up the chimney. And this poor dormer, uh, it had, the roof was full of bats, bats those cute little things that come out in the evening and fly around. And um, I, I, when I look at this, I think I can see a hole where they were. Uh, but here's the new after, and it looks much better. And again, uh, they had turned the assembly hall into a basketball court, which made some sense when they were having the school there but now it has a much more elegant look. And if you wanted to rent it for a nice party for 150 people, why? You could probably do that. It's much more amenable. And it was all looking great by its 100th anniversary in 2008. So I hope you will get out there. You will see some new things, some different things. Uh, the green on the flats. The flats was the big, this big green in between all the little houses. Somebody bought three little houses and put up one big house. And that was one thing about company towns that people did mention to me. Um, you know, like when they were kids, they didn't know. They played down on the green. They didn't even think about it. But as they got bigger, they realized, oh, those houses are much nicer than my house but when they're playing on the green, there's still a community. And so, yeah, there were different sized houses and different levels of occupations, but they were a community. But now they're a community with more big houses and there's another one. So let me leave you with three giant things, records that were set by Levere's so that you can prove that you know something about it <laughs> tomorrow or the next day. Uh, so the Levere's dynamite plant was the longest operating DuPont dynamite plant anywhere in the USA. So that was from 1908 when it started operations and 1971 when it finished, when it blew up. <laughs> it was the biggest industry in Douglas County at its time. And it produced a billion, not a million, not a hundred million, a thousand million, a billion pounds of dynamite. And I want to thank all the many people who helped me, Sarah and Kent and Mark and Stephen and Carolyn and Bev and Marlene and John, who all told me about LaVere's and helped me decide about things or inform me. So I hope you get there, I hope you get to see it. And I was reminded by uh, Joanne and, and, and Bob that uh, the walking tour was just great. We had them when I was out there, but I guess they don't have them anymore, but it's a fun place to take a Sunday drive. 
So, question. Thank you very much, Joyce. So yeah, if anyone has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question, and Joyce will try to answer them. Should I leave this up or should I take it down? I'm not sure. I'll, I'll put a separate screen up here in just a second. Okay, all right. Then, yeah, then Hi, Joyce. Thank you so much for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm a new Colorado and I moved from Hawaii last year, so I'm not familiar with your, um, you know, your history and any designation of buildings, old buildings, but um, have any, or is the whole town or some of the buildings designated um, as uh, historic landmarks? Yes. Uh, in fact, I did the landmark on the uh, clubhouse uh, back before 2008. They were trying to get it done by its 100th anniversary. So yes, it does have historic significance and recognition. The entire town of Louviers is actually, uh, Douglas County is trying to keep that as a historic town itself, that it is in the master plan for Douglas County to keep Louviers historic. I don't know about that. I mean, that's, I suppose- It was when I was on the Historic Preservation Board. That was one of the things that we always talked about. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's one reason you do a landmark is to, you know, acknowledge it, and then, yeah, hopefully it will stay that way. Yeah. Joyce? Yes? Thanks for this uh, talk and everything. Um, I, I used to have a, 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 my background civil engineering, and we had a job to do in Louviers one time dealing with a, cor a, a company called Molly Corp. Okay. And they, pro they processed aluminum more from Quest of Mine in New Mexico. And they brought it up here to process it. Do you have any information on that? That was in the 70s and 80s when that okay, happened. No, no. I, that's one of my weak areas is, the, uh, you know, exactly there. What I learned is there are many different uh, processes and many different uh, uh, forms of explosives. And I don't know if that would have been an explosive. But uh, Well, yeah. I mean, to get the ore, they had to use explosives. And I imagine that was one reason my... Uh, DuPont might have had a role in processing. Right. That. Okay. Maybe it was that. Yeah. No. I'm... Yeah, it was rather substantial uh, operation, actually. Okay. That's yeah. The 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 people who work with it have have said that to me, sort of the way you said it uh, then. It, it was a a big operation and well done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joyce, a couple of questions. Hi, Ed. <laughs> How are you doing? Do you have any feel for what the uh, peak working population and the total population may have been up there? I, I avoided the numbers because I was having trouble finding for sure. But um, like I saw the population for it at one point was, well, the city itself has never had more than, I think, 400 and something people in it. And I, I'm not sure about the plant. So I really didn't try to speculate on that because I, I didn't find the figures, but I could, you know, like counting and there were a hundred and something. And I'm pretty sure there were at least 140 people working there at one time. And so probably around 400 living there, but those are guesses. I did look at the census uh, and it's smaller now than it was at its peak, of course. Okay, my second question is, uh, in your picture, you showed all men, uh, working men. Were any women ever allowed to work at the point? I don't think so. I don't know any that did. I do know that the women did the fire brigade. <laughs> they were the firefighters during the day if a fire broke out because the guys were all in the plant. <laughs> but uh, they even had a women's they didn't even let them bowl together. I don't know. <laughs> so there are I, a lot of pictures in the uh, Denver Public Library's collection of the Rocky Mountain News about DuPont. And I recall one, I did the uh, landscape component. So that was, wasn't was really my topic. But I recall one particular with two women dressed as housewives holding sticks of dynamite in their hands and professing how safe they were. Uh, via the DuPont manufacturing process. Oh, okay. As long as they're new dynamite sticks. <laughs> oh, so all the old the dynamite 
think they're not so safe. <laughs> okay, we get more volatile, do we? <laughs> As we get older. Okay. <laughs> Joyce, I have a couple questions. This okay. is Diane. Um, I think you said in 1962 they started selling the homes uh, and the, res the residents, the workers, had the first choice. But is that when then others started coming into the community, even though they were not, they might not have been part of the working at the plant? Yes, precisely. And there was that uh, nursery area um, that was just land, and that was sold, and people could come in and build the house that they wanted on the property. And a few of them said, you know, people said, well, that's modern. It doesn't fit. <laughs> and uh, you know, but the but there weren't any um, landmarks done at that point, so it it fit. And these other big houses, they they're not at all like you know they they don't have that same feel. Right. Original houses, but there doesn't seem to be any rules against it. Was there a grocery store in the area? Um, that I wasn't even sure when the hotel. I'm not even sure if the hotel had a grocery store. Um, I I don't know of one. Well, that's close enough to Littleton that um, that might have been where they where they got their groceries and stuff. Well, and it's uh, you know it's not that far from Castle Rock either. Um, Sedalia. Yeah, in Sedalia. So, um, but but there weren't grocery stores like that were, you know, um, uh, brand name grocery stores. Uh, there might have been just a sales area. And I, and do, I you think know, do, do you know how large the community is now? It's about uh, 300 now. Okay. Yeah, it's, that would be, you know, and, and growing actually. <laughs> so. Joyce, do you know if it was a true con uh, company town? Did the workers have to live there or could they live other places? They could live other places because like Carolyn, you know, they had to live in Denver and commute on the train mm -hmm. um, to uh, get to, well, they went to school in Denver, but dad had to ride the train to work. Uh, so, um, I don't think they had to. And a lot of people, there is a lot of crossover between Sedalia and uh, La Beers. There would be, you know, um, people who lived in Sedalia would work in La Beers. So I don't mm -hmm. think it was a rule. Did, did this plant, you showed a map of different mining areas from Alaska to, to uh, Chile and everything in between. Did this plant supply all the dynamite for those areas? Ah, you know? they, there, there are other, no, there were others. There was a Washington, I know they, you know, had a plant in Washington. And, and I know Delaware went to work making dynamite too. They, uh, um, DuPont had plants throughout the Midwest. They had one in Arizona, yeah. in Iowa, in yeah. um, Michigan, and uh, in Montana too for the copper op copper operations in addition to the one in Washington. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, a billion's a lot of dynamite, but, but still that's not an old, nowhere near enough compared to the excavation. I mean, okay. you see these open pits in Utah and in yeah. and Helena, Montana. I mean, that's a huge, huge amount of dynamite. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Joy. Hi. So how come so many people decided to um, move to, like, go to the Sedalia Church instead of the Olivier's Church? Well, I I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, that kind of history doesn't usually get written down. <laughs> but um, the preacher was a Presbyterian, and the church that opened in Sedalia was Presbyterian. So that might have been a pull. And then people had cars, and I think they just um, were free to go wherever they wanted. When they had to walk, you know, then they really wanted a church right there. But uh, once in the 40s and 50s, when 
cars were something that a normal working person I think, I think that was more it but i don't know it could have been a big fight or could i don't know <laughs> for sure okay thank you okay. joyce today uh, is is uh, louviers a municipality or is it unincorporated douglas county I should know that, but I'd have to look at my landmark to tell you, but it's a village. I think that's the, the, the Levere's Village Clubhouse. I think the village is, is the best description of it, but that might not be the legal description. So it may have its own form of government then? Yeah, they do have to do like their own water, I know, when they, when, you know, when they lost all the support that DuPont was doing for the community. One of the things they had to pick up was the water. The phone company um, uh, went, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, Denver and Castle Rock used to be long distance and because it was just the company phone. So, so but then it went public kind of on most things. Yeah, just like everybody else, they went with the phone company or they went with the electric company. What, what influence did the railroads have on this town? I know they well, go through this two lines, but, but did the railroad companies have anything to do with this town? Um, they brought supplies in. They, they used trucks to take the dynamite where they wanted it to go because the places were didn't always have rails. Um, and they didn't want other people handling their dynamite, you know. Um, but the supplies that came in as, as chemicals came in by rail. The rails haven't changed. I mean, there were two rails there when they arrived, and there's still two rails there. So I, I think it was a resource that they needed and wanted, and it was there. And um, it probably helped the rails, you know, to, to have yet another customer. But it was something they looked for and they got before they selected. Joyce, can you tell me about the Denver Polo Club building that's there now? What the Denver Polo Club building? No, I haven't been there. Uh, I went out to take a look and everything, but I don't know about the Denver Polo Club building. It's been like uh, eight or 10 years. No, it's been 10 years since I've worked there. So not up on the latest. <laughs> hmm. oh, oh, plot. That sounds interesting. Sure. So I told you everything else you wanted to know, huh? Any final questions? I have a question, but I don't know how to do this. Well, we're hearing you now, so just ask yeah. a question. Um, was there a cemetery, and if not, the people that were killed in those explosions, are they honored in any way in the town? There is not a cemetery in the Levere's community. Um, and so that would be yeah, one thing where the Sedalia people, there is, is a cemetery. And um, I don't think, I don't know how they were honored. They were recorded, but um, I mean, it would be even hard to find enough to bury, you know? So I don't know of any special honor that has been done. and. That was 11 people total. So. Well, that last explosion, one of the uh, people killed that was a close neighbor and friend, and he was not a worker. He was more in the management. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know how, the, how that all happened. Yeah, I, and that's the kind of the tragedy or the sad side of an explosion is everything is blown up the building yeah. people you know you, there's no way to tell what happened yeah but 
80 years of 80 years of operations and only 11 people got killed that's a remarkable safety record okay that <laughs> still doesn't sound safe to me but yeah no it is considering what you're dealing, considering what you're dealing with yeah and prior to osha that, uh having been on the other end of it the mining and using dynamite uh dupont really had a very careful instruction that you 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 handle it very very much caution and stored it on your property well away from any working area there were a lot of things you did but this is in in the 40s and 50s my dad did mining on the western slope uh, you were careful very careful with it and uh, you know in certain cases it'll burn but it won't explode but if you have everything combined and it goes and it's terrible that's why it's dynamite and uh, but the, I, I was impressed with how much DuPont focused on how you use the, sa the material and work around it and safely. Safety was a big concern. Yeah. yeah, I was impressed with that, with the the people that I talked with that had worked with DuPont, yeah. And the other part of it is, of course, is the igniters, the uh, caps that they have for blasting. Those things are also tricky, but they're small. They're about as big as your finger, uh, your thumb. And... Um, and they have, they're tied by a cable and there's usually an electronic, electrical current and that's how you blast or get the stick to don't blow up after you put it in the hole. And um, that's, uh, those, uh, those devices are also, I don't know if DuPont made those. Yeah, I, the only one that I found that I could understand was this rope dynamite. <laughs> And I was trying to imagine that as a as a rope. That's but, probably what they're talking about is rope dynamite is a blasting cap because it um, it that's what you that you know this you see in the movies where they light the wire and all that and then it <laughs> it, it goes and it blows you know you have so many minutes. Yeah, well, right. that's kind of what you're calling rope dynamite. Okay. But, but uh, it was but in. The modern now, what they do is they have an actual current of electricity, and and that sparks the dynamite, or if it's dynamite that they're using, sometimes they use ammonium nitrate and oil and uh, other means of blowing up things, and those things also are sensitive to temperature change. Okay. That's what it, that's what causes it to blow up. Ammonium nitrate fuel actually is a much has much more power, explosive power. Uh, and exactly. it's almost used commonly in in mining industry now today. Uh, yeah. But it, uh, it was scary times. We had in our mine in uh, Western Colorado. Uh, we had one event where we we, we used the old caps and lighted a fuse to set mm -hmm. it off. And Dad would go down the hole and finish drilling and so forth, and set the sticks down the hole and light the fuse and run like crazy <laughs> to, to stay spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One day, one day, uh, it didn't go off. We waited. Oh. We waited. Go back in. Almost an hour, and he says, "I don't think it's going to go off. Let's go home." So we left the site, went home, and then he and one of the guys that goes with him to our, to this mine the next uh, next week went up and uh, took an extra stick of dynamite. When they discovered that the fuse had gone out, that the cab, the fuse had fallen out of the cab. So he got another stick of dynamite, laid it on that stuff in there, and uh, lit the fuse and ran like crazy again. This time when it went off, because it was about twice the amount of dynamite went off, it, it, it went off and he discovered quickly he had not gotten far enough and they stood there. He says, many things, rocks are falling all right, and big rocks and so forth. And unfortunately, nobody got hit, but it was kind of scary. That yeah. was kind of getting close to the end of his mining career. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Discover why the DuPonts choose, chose the name Louviers for what was originally called Toluca, you may know, is a train stop at that location. Yeah. I know the Louviers in uh, Delaware is named after the city of Louviers in France because the DuPonts wanted to establish a wool mill there, a woolen mill. And they, uh, that, did, that business did not succeed, but they have kept the name of Louviers, Delaware for that section across from their original. But I've tried to discover why they chose the name Louviers for their 
Colorado plant. They also used the name Louviers in their Washington plant. The main boulevard in the Washington State plant is called Louviers Boulevard. I've tried to contact the DuPont Library, but uh, they seem to be a little bit hesitant about visitors and they say yeah. the early records are, uh, are poorly, uh, uh, poorly organized or disorganized. So I haven't been able, but I'm fascinated to, to know why they chose that name for this remote dynamite plant in Col Colorado. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it was in honor of some member of the family, and I, I think it... Um, well, I, Alfred I, DuPont, uh, he they, originally established, or, uh, well, Victor DuPont, Eleuther's brother, was mm -hmm. uh, tried to establish the woolen mill, I don't know, 300 years ago, and uh, they probably traveled to France to get... Um, manufacturing uh, uh, as they did with dynamite and gunpowder they brought french manufacturing techniques and machinery to the u.s to to do it but uh, i'm tantalized having spent so much time trying to research you know the establishment of the of the village in my case that my interest the village and the landscaping around the village why they chose the name louvieres i'm not sorry they did but it's just a tantalizing question yeah, I, I think some member of the family that probably had something to do with it lived no in Louvier. That. And I don't know if Nemours was just a family name or also a city. I Nemours was a city and they were given, they took that name because DuPont in France is a fairly common name. Uh -huh. So I think when they were ennobled by the king, he, he allowed them to call themselves DuPont de, Num de Nemours, which was the wife of. Uh, Right. I think uh, yeah. the original DuPont's wife came from Newmore, Sophie Lede. So they okay. used that, they added that okay. to their name to so ennoble their city. name. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't have that one down solid enough to talk about it. <laughs> well, they, there's so much, uh, there's so much, uh, what would you call it, amorphous history of the DuPont family mm -hmm. that uh, it's hard to track everything down. Some of it's poorly recorded. So, yeah, well, and I appreciate but it. I'm happy they chose that name because I think it's a really scenic site. I mean, for Colorado to be able to drive on Santa Fe on your way to from to or from Castle Rock, and you see these, you see across this this grove of huge trees over there, and you have to wonder, well, what is this? Why did this happen? It's a, I think it's a, an amenity to Douglas County in Colorado in my opinion. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Joyce, and thank you everyone for all those wonderful questions and comments tonight. So I think at this point we'll wrap it up and we'll look forward to seeing you all. I did see the participant number hit at least 127 at one point. So mm -hmm. thank you all for showing up tonight. And uh, we look forward to our members coming to the December program and coming up to the future. We will uh, have more programs starting next year again. So thank you. See you in January. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you thank very you, much. You are all welcome. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. I learned a lot myself getting ready for it. <laughs>